Recently, I had a gentleman uh, ask me a question about hell. And I want you to ponder it tonight. What does it benefit God to torture people in hell? That was how he asked this question. And this gentleman, after his studies of the Scripture, did not believe that there was a hell, was what I gathered. Or if there was one, it wasn't going to last very long. He seemed to believe that people who don't receive Jesus as their Lord and Savior today uh, would um, maybe have a short time of punishment or, or would it sometimes just cease to exist. And I suppose, I do, I suppose that would be a pleasant thought. That would, when we consider the reality of hell. But the fact that keeps us from understanding any of those ideas is that the Bible simply does not teach uh, that way. It teaches a, uh, a hell that most certainly is hell. Even though there are many verses on this topic of eternal punishment, I want us to look at just a few and not only answer his one question, but in total I want to answer five questions about hell that each and every one of us can hear and understand and be able to tell others about this place. Because we don't want anybody, anybody, to go to hell, do we? People say that, you know. They look at one another and they say, you go to hell, don't they? But, but if they only knew what that actually meant, that's the absolute worst thing you could possibly imagine to tell another person. So first of all, first of all, let's get a clear picture about what the Bible says about hell with this first question. Who will occupy hell? And we find... An answer here in Revelation 21, the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Now, evil people go to hell, right? Is that any surprise to us? Most people naturally assume that people who are evil and are doing bad things are going to go to hell. They recognize that there is some kind of a cosmic justice out here for wrongs done, even though they normally don't want to apply that logic to themselves. I can't remember anybody I've ever looked at and I said, Do you, are you going to hell? They don't say that. But if you look at them and say, am I going to heaven? They say that, right? How many funerals have you ever been to where they say, well, this guy, he went to hell. It's obvious. I've never been to a funeral where they said that. But the reality of it is this. Jesus said there is a narrow way and a broad way that leads to destruction, right? The narrow way is the one of uh, Jesus Christ, trusting in him. That's what it means here. Uh, Jesus talked about being born again. Uh, and here it talks about the second death. You can be born twice and only die once. Or you can be uh, born once and die twice. You see? And that death that you receive is not a, a, a finite death. It is an eternal death. Just the same way when you're born again, what do you get? An eternal life. So when you face the second death, what do you get? The eternal death, right? I'll go into that a little bit more deeper later on. But I want us to see that here. The people don't recognize that most people are going to hell. It's just a fact. It is the wide way, right? The wide way. And, and we need to uh, use that logic on our, ourselves. I'm afraid we all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We are in a terrible, terrible predicament, the entire human race, right? Uh, 
And these mentioned here are people who rejected God's laws as we all have in some sort or way or another. Their lives here, it says, are characterized by murders, violence, right? Sex, witchcraft, that by worshiping a false god. How many people in the world today are worshiping false gods, right? They seek to follow God through religions such as Islam, Hinduism, um, offshoots such as Mormonism. All of these do not receive Jesus as their Savior, do they? There are also false Christianities out here that people are falling into. They're gathering into these false Christianities. And where are they going to end up if they haven't put their whole faith, not in anything else, but in the Son of God? For He's the only way of salvation, right? The only way. Jesus says there will be a day when people will come before the throne of God, all these ones and all these different false religions, and they'll be told, I never knew you. That's the most terrible words you can possibly imagine. Because where's your next step when He looks at you and He says, I never knew you? It's into hell. It's into hell. Notice, the first two, though, that he mentions. I think that's important. The first two. He says the cowardly and the unbelieving. Now, these are the people who are ashamed of Jesus and afraid to stand out for him. And therefore, that proves that they are unbelievers. You realize that? If you uh, think that I, I got saved, but I never say anything about Jesus, and I never show my love for Jesus, I live as a covert Christian all the time, it's very, un very likely that you don't really believe in Jesus, okay? You don't really believe in Him if you have not uh, shown that. The Bible says in Romans 10, those who believe in Him shall not be ashamed, right? They won't be. There's a lot of people on that wide way to destruction. And you could have done all the things in this list. But if you don't believe, if you don't believe, that is why you will go to hell. If you don't believe. Jesus paid for all of those sins upon the cross, didn't He? But if you won't receive that gift through faith, that He died for you and paid for all those sins you've done and all those sins you're going to do, okay? Because you still sin. I have no doubt within my mind you still fall into sin. If you haven't trusted in Him to pay the price for that, you'll not know the joy of being with Him in heaven one day, will you? The next passage of those in hell shows us the specifics of what happened on the final day. And uh, at the final judgment. And it shows who will be placed in hell. In Revelation 20, 14, it says, Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And here we see where everyone who was in Hades, uh, what we would call hell today, will be placed in the lake of fire. And this is their final placement of hell. The lake of fire is a different spiritual place than where hell is right now. And what is Hades, you might ask? What's Hades? What's all that talking about? Well, that is actually the Greek word that's being used several places in the Bible. And hell, in the King James Version, it says that. You see, since the cross took place, mankind either goes straight to heaven to be with God or straight to an uncomfortable holding place called Hades in the NKJV and hell in the KJV. And Hades is literally the Greek word for this spiritual reality. Some of y'all remember the parable of the rich man and the poor man Lazarus. It gave us a glimpse in what it looked like after a person died during the Old Testament. They both opened their eyes up in one place with two different compartments, with a great gulf fixed between them is what the Bible says, what Jesus said. The rich man, it says, was in torment, in flames, and he begged for just a drop of water to cool him while he was there. While Lazarus, he faced no distress at all. Well, he was on the side of what's called, Jesus called, Abraham's bosom. He was right there up next to Father Abraham, right? Now later we read, in Ephesians 4, that Jesus led captivity captive 
after His resurrection. And it's understood that He led those Old Testament saints in Abraham's bosom on up into heaven after His resurrection. And that's why Paul can say in Philippians 1 that when he died, he would not go be with Abraham. But what does he say? He says, I'll go be with Christ, which is far better, right? I'll go be with Christ. So when a Christian dies today, we go straight into the presence of God, right? Straight into His presence. While those who have rejected Christ still go to Hades, which might as well be called hell today because that's all that's going on down there. It's the same rich man. You could see him. Well, you may not because it's darkness. He's there. He's still crying out for a drop of water to land upon his tongue. And he is still there within those flames that Jesus talked about. Up until this judgment day, in Revelation, when all those who have died and went to Hades or hell as we know it will be cast into the lake of fire and in the final place of torment for them in that lake of fire. That's what happens on the final judgment day one day when all will stand before the throne of God and uh, be repaid according to their works. It says this when they stand there, in Revelation 20 and verse 15, and anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. You see, the final resurrection will occur on judgment day and those who in Hades will be resurrected. And this verse tells us why they are there on the judgment day. The resurrected dead from Hades will find that their names was not found in the book of life which shows us all who chose life in this life. Do you hear me? All those who receive Jesus as their Savior, their names are written in the book of life. Right? Well, they have eternal life. It's the reference to all who have received Jesus as their Savior and Lord in the New Testament age after the cross. And all of those who will be placed in the lake of fire, their names won't be written down. I want to ask you all tonight, is your name written in that book? Is your name written in that book? Only you know for sure, right? Only you know for sure if your name's written in that book. And if you ain't sure, you need to make sure, okay? You need to find out and make certain of this because this is one thing you do not want to make a mistake about. And now there is one other resident there within hell that I've not mentioned. Revelation 20, verse 10 tells us, The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Now people claim that the devil rules in hell right now. No. The Bible says he's going back and forth, seeking whom he may devour like a roaring lion, right? He's here on this earth. <laughs> Look at this earth. I mean, you can kind of tell he's here upon this earth. Uh, he does not rule in hell. He faces the same fire and torments that all others are going to face. And the Bible actually tells us that hell, the lake of fire, was actually made for the devil and his angels, not for mankind. It's made for them, not for us. But all who choose to fall in his rebellion... They'll be heading that way as well. All those who refuse to trust in Jesus as their Savior and their Lord. So hell is for the devil and all who will not repent and come to Christ for salvation and receive life. It, receive life. Think about how many people tonight are choosing not to receive life. Now the question, second question I want us to look at. How long does hell last? How long does hell last? Listen to this verse. This verse, I think, explains it better than any other. Matthew 25, verse 46. Jesus speaking, And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. Now, everlasting and eternal, you can't see it there in the English, but it's the same Greek word, aeonus, aeonus, that's what I'm trying to say, aeonus. And it means in this context clearly without end, never to cease, 
everlasting, eternal. It means forever. It means it never ends, right? So if heaven is going to be eternal, then hell will also be eternal because both are being referenced by the same word, right? So you have to think that heaven's going to end if you want to think that hell's going to end. And this is important because many have tried to make an argument that hell wasn't going to last forever, but heaven would. And God didn't want us to make that mistake, did He? He didn't want us to make that mistake. They are both on the same time frame. And we must be certain, absolutely certain, of where we're heading. Now, now we know the residents. We know the time frame of how long hell is going to last. Now, what happens in hell? What goes on there? Well, this is what the Scripture tells us in Matthew 13, verses 49 through 50. So it will be, it says, at the end of the age, Jesus speaking, the angels will come forth, separate the wicked from among the just, and cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. In hell, people are not experiencing joy at all. Joy is a foreign word to hell. It says here they are wailing. What is wailing? Wailing is excessive weeping and crying. If you hear anything in hell, that's what you'll hear. People weeping and crying in the darkness where they're at. They are forever disturbed where they are. They are gnashing their teeth, it says here. What's that? It's a grating of the teeth. Rubbing the teeth back and forth. They are forever experiencing frustration and not being able to do what they want to do and, and, and crying forever and ever. Hell is in no way pleasant whatsoever. Second Thessalonians 1.9 It tells us there, These shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power. See, they're not just in some holding tank. They are being punished, right? They are being punished with not a finite destruction, it says here, but an everlasting destruction. And what is the punishment that they're receiving? They are outside the presence of the Lord. Isn't that what it says? They are outside the presence of the Lord. Even now, even now, the sinner and those who want to, don't want to have anything to do with God, those who would rather spit in His face rather than look at Him, God still is kind to them, isn't He? God is still present with them. He's still there. Even now, they have some good things being in God's presence. It says in the Scripture, He allows the rain to fall on the just and on the unjust. And the idea there means that He provides rain for everybody's crops. He doesn't just go rain on the people who are Christians so their crops will grow and they'll have food, does He? Job's friends made that mistake, right? Now He goes and He rains and He gives the... Sometimes the, the, the bad man, he has a wonderful life in this life, doesn't he? Yet he never bends the knee to Christ. He never gives thanks to God for what he has. <laughs> like the rich man and Lazarus, right? And so the, the, they, whether it be good or whether they be bad, here in this life we have some sense of being in the presence of God. And there, that's why we have joy at all. Everything that is life comes from God. Did you know that? Everything. But then... Hell is when there will be no more of God's presence in your life. Hell is being outside the presence of God. Now, is, is God there? Yes. But not His joy. Not His blessing. God's everywhere. God's everywhere. But not the joy. And that is the worst punishment you can possibly imagine. It's why they're wailing. It's why they're gnashing with their teeth. Because they finally understand all their blessings, all the good that ever was, came from God. And there will, only, there will be only the punishment which Jesus took for them, but those in hell would not accept as a free gift from Him, right? 
When He's on the cross, everything went dark, didn't it? When He's on that cross that day. And He felt the presence of God. My God, my God, why hast Thou forsaken me? Right? What was He facing right then? Hell! Because He was outside. I don't understand it. I don't, I don't pretend to explain to you how it works. All I know is that's what occurred, okay? And that's what hell is. That's what hell is. It says of what's going on in hell, outside the presence with the wailing and the gnashing of teeth, it says in Revelation 14, 11, and the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night, who worship the beast in his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Now, this is speaking specifically to those living in the tribulation, which is a time of judgment on the world that happens after the rapture. But you will notice they are not receiving anything different here than what we have already seen happening in hell, right? It is darkness. It is torment. It is no rest day or night. And it is a fire. It's a flame. And we, we, we've been burnt. Maybe been burnt before. I, when I was young, my grandpa was smoking a cigarette. He slung it back. He hit my arm. Woo! I jumped because it hurt, right? That little bit of burning. But that's a physical thing. This is something beyond our minds. And Jesus is using fire to explain to you what it's like. It's a lake of fire and the smoke of their torment rises up forever and ever. So we know here, we know uh, who's going to be there. We know what's going to occur. Uh, we know that it lasts forever. Fourthly here, why do we need to be certain of what the doctrine of hell teaches? Why do we need to be certain? Well, Jesus explained it very well. We want to beware of everything that leads to hell. This is what he said in Mark 9, 43-48. He says, if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter into life maimed rather than having two hands to go to hell into the fire that shall never be quenched where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. For it is better for you to enter life maimed rather than having two feet to be cast into hell and in the fire that shall never be quenched, where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. And if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out of your head. It is better for you to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye rather than having two eyes to be cast into hellfire where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. This is why we need to be absolutely serious about the reality of hell. And be absolutely certain of what it teaches. Jesus Himself tells us to stay away from sin which leads to hell in this life by whatever means necessary, right? He tells us that hell will never end and it gives a picture of worms eating us and fire burning the lost forever and ever. Run from sin and run to the Savior. Don't live in death in those places of sin where God is not, where God will not even entertain the presence of sin. Run to Him. And that's where you need to be. This pictures a true believer who stays away from sin because he or she really believes. And if you're in a lifestyle, is a lifestyle of sin, you are deceived. And there is no physical thing worth spending eternity in hell. There's no physical thing worth spending eternity in hell. You say, I can't give this up. You say, this is my identity. You say, this is all that I am. You don't need that. That's death. That's death. That's death. And destruction. Forever and ever. Finally, the question the man asked me. What does it benefit God to torture people in hell? The answer is that God doesn't desire this for people at all. It doesn't benefit Him at all. He doesn't want to benefit from you burning in hell. He must, though, because of who He is. He is a God of love, but He is also a God of justice. 2 Peter 3.9 says this, The Lord is not slack 
concerning His promise. Have you heard His promises that there's a judgment day coming tonight? He says He's not slack concerning His promise. He's not putting it off as some count slackness. But He is long-suffering. He's patient toward us. Not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God doesn't want anyone to go through the horrors of hell. Did you know that? He don't want anybody to go through the horrors of hell. He did not prepare it for people. He prepared it, as I said earlier, for the devil and his angels, right? Even when all of mankind rejected him, though, all of mankind, it says, he knew every one of us would reject him, right? He still provided a way, a way, a great cost to himself to save the world that would rather spit in him in the face. We may think, this biblical idea of hell, it's overkill. I ain't really done nothing that bad that I should burn in flames and be tortured forevermore. You may think what we have done, something, what could we have done worthy of eternal punishment, such as the things that we've talked about here tonight. I mean, e even the crooks get off after so long. I mean, this sounds horrible, right? Well, when God Himself, God Himself had to come out of heaven, and come down here and live a perfect life for you, then give Himself in the form of Jesus Christ as a sacrifice for your sins to overlook that grace, that mercy, and still reject Him? Well, God's done all He can do, ain't He? Our greatest sin worthy of eternal hell is rejecting that incredible cosmic love and choosing to go to hell rather than receive a free gift from our Creator. It's the biggest smack in the face that you wouldn't receive that gift, that you would mock Him all the way to your death. And people have done that. People have done that. That's the height of arrogance. And I promise you, those who go to hell have to shove the hands of love out of their way to get there, don't they? They do. Now, now that we are certain of what hell is and what God did to save us from hell, let's take this study as a reminder how important it is that we remember our Savior's last words on earth. Y'all remember the last words? I mean, it comes in the form of the Great Commission. Each gospel gives it a little bit differently. One of my favorites, and the one I take to heart, is Mark 16. Mark 16. It's what we name the television program off of. Jesus said this, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, every person, every human being. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. And that is hell, isn't it? That is hell. I hope you're enjoying the sermons here and have subscribed to my channel on YouTube, but I would love even more to meet with you in person at the Omega Baptist Church.